administration, Adonai reigns, Adonai has reigned, and Adonai shall reign for all eternity. Adonai will give might to his people. Adonai will bless his people with shalom. Would you please join us as the Hazan leads us in the Vayhi bin Soa. Vayhi bin Soa Aaron, Vayomer Moshe, Kuma Adonai, Veafutsu Oyvecha, Veyanusu Mesanecha, Mipanecha, Ki Mitzion Tetze Torah, Ki Mitzion Tetze Torah, Adonai Mirushalayim Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Baruch Shenatan Torah Torah Le'amo Yisrael B'Kdushato Hine HaTorah, Hine Yeshua. Hine HaTorah, Asher Samoshe. Hine HaTorah, Devar Adonai. Yesh Lanu Torah. Asher Samoshe Yesh Lanu Torah Nevar Adonai Hine HaTorah Hine Yeshua Hine Huba Nevar Adonai Hine HaTorah Hine Yeshua Yes, Lanu Torah, Nevar Adonai, Hine Atorah, Hine Yeshua, Hine Huba, Nevar Adonai, Hine Atorah, Hine Yeshua. Yes, Lanu Torah, Asher Samoshe. 
Continue to magnify and lift up the name of Hashem by bringing all of our tithes and offerings into the storehouse this morning. We receive them kol achad. We come and give them kol achad. All is one. The way that we receive them here at Sar Shalom is we have three sadaqah boxes here at the front. And so we just invite families and friends to come forward and worship and with joy to give to Hashem. And let us just magnify His name with all of our gifts. So please let's come and magnify Him today. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Hashem. Father, receive every gift today as a fragrant offering before your throne. Hashem, we love you, Adonai. You've given us so much. You make provision for us every moment of every day. Hashem, may your name be praised by these gifts. May it be your will, Hashem, that you give a thousandfold blessing according to Devarim 111. Seed to the sower, bread to the eater. And everybody said, Amen. Baruch Hashem. Would you please rise? As we prepare for the reading of the Torah, and please welcome our bar mitzvah man, Manashe, as he makes aliyah to the Torah to read today. Amen. Please join us for the bracha. Baruchu et Adonai hamevorach. Baruch Adonai hamevorach leolam vayed. Baruch Adonai hamevorach leolam vayed. Baruch ata Adonai. Eloheinu melech haolam, asher bachar banu mikol hamim, venatan lanu et torato, baruch ata Adonai, noten ha Torah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Yomer Adonai El Moshe Lamor, Deber El Benay, Israel Vaya Marta Alahim Vasu Lahim Zitzi Al Kante, Vig Day Him, Le Dora Tom, Benatnu, Al Zitzi Al Kanath Betel Tekalit. Vahaya lekim le zit zit, yuratam oto uskartem, et kol mitzvah adonai. Vahasatim otem velo tataru akare. Levakim ivakare inekum asher atem zonim akare him. Leman tizkaru. Vasatim et komitsva vehayatim kiloshim le elekum. Ani Adonai elekum. Asher hosite ekum. Mayam. Mitzarim le hot lekum. Lay Elohim, Ani Adonai Elohekum. Yashar Koach, Amen. That was, and I forgot to now, that was Numbers 15, verses 37 through 41. Sorry about that. <laughs> and our portion for the English. My knees are shaking here you now. Y'all forgive me. All right. This here is uh, Numbers 13, verses 1 through 10. Adonai said to Moshe, Send me on, on your behalf to reconnoiter the land of Kenan, which I am giving to the people of Israel. From each ancestral tribe, send someone who is a leader in his tribe. Moshe dispatched them from the Paran Desert as Adonai had ordered. All of them were leading men among the people of Israel. Here are their names. From the tribe of Reuben, Shammai, Shammal, the son of Zachor. From the tribe of Shimon, Shafta, the son of Horah. From the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Euphanel. From the tribe of Is Issachar, Egel, the son of Yosef. From the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, the son of Nun. None. From the tribe of ben Yamin, Pateh, the son of Rathu. From the tribe of Zethulon, Gadiel, the son of Sode. From the tribe of Yosef, that is, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gade, the son of Susi, Susai. From the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamria. From the tribe of Asher, Situr, the son of Michiel. From the tribe of Nephtepha, Nabi, the son of Vosi, and from the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Micaiah. 
These are the names of the men Moshe sent out to the recorner of the land. Moshe gave to Hosea, the son of Nun, the name Joshua. Moshe sent them to reconnoitre the land of Kenan, instructing them, go up to the Negev and to the hills and see what the land is like. Notice the people living there, whether they are strong or weak, few or many, in what kind of country they live in, whether it's good or bad, and what kind of cities they live in, open or fortified. See whether the land is fertile or unproductive, and whether there is wood in it or not. Finally, be bold enough to bring back some of the fruit of the land. When they left, it was for the season for the first grapes to ripen. Amen. Please join us as we say the bracha at the conclusion of the Torah reading. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu Torah emet, vechaye olam nata betocheinu. Baruch ata Adonai, noten ha Torah. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as Menashe brings us his drash on the Torah portion. Okay. Uh, thank you all very much. Uh, like I said, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. The verses that I read today in Hebrew were Numbers 15, verses 37 uh, through 41, which is, you know, the reason we wear tzitzit. And I really attached that the first time I started walking this walk, you know. That's the first thing I grabbed, you know. <laughs> was tzitzit. And the, and, the, and the thing about it is, you know, it's, it's why I sort of brought about it to to get my name is that uh, sometimes you forget the Lord's commandments. You know, you don't forget to follow his word and you'd be led astray easily. And that's why I took the name of Manasseh. If you remember, if you read about Manasseh starting in 2 Kings 21 verse 1 and then also 2 Chronicles verses 33 verse 1, he was the most evilest king that was ever in Israel's time. He, uh, he led the, you know, if you read about it, which I'm sure y'all have, when you read, you read about him, he uh, led uh, Judah, he led uh, Jerusalem more evil, or made them more evil than the people, the Gentiles, that lived there before them. And that's how bad it got. But the thing about it is, I was reading there, and it said that the people refused to hear the word of Hashem, and then Manasseh led them astray. The people laid responsibility on them, just not on Manasseh, because they refused to hear his word. And the thing about this is, though, that it comes down to it, is Manasseh, you know, was even, and Hashem brought wrath upon him by the Assyrians come and captured him. They put a hook in his nose and, and put bronze chains around him and led him to a prison in Babylon. Which, but they didn't take him in a limo. It, 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 you know what I'm saying? It's, it's a thousand miles from Jerusalem to the prison in Babylon where they put him. And so it's all about so he took so whatever that took 40, 50, 60 days to get there. Uh, he was in anguish, and they put him in a in a cell. And this is from extra biblical reading I've read and stuff. They put him in a cell and probably had a, a hole about that big, just let enough sunlight in and with a, a, a big rock that blocked the hole and an iron bar gate that would slide back so they could throw him his food. And that's why he stayed for a year or more, not seeing nothing else but living that with a in cell. Well, it come to be that he finally come to repentance there and uh, he uh, said his prayer is true, true from the heart and the Lord forgive him returned him to his Amen. to his kingdom yes. wow. as bad as he was you know what I'm saying but the thing is it didn't stop there as many of us have uh, reached out for back in my yard to reach out for God, Lord's salvation then as soon as you feel like you can go on and live your life the way you want to mm-hmm. Manasseh really truly repented. He went back and he took out all the idols that he had put in Jerusalem. He took away every, everything that he had undone from his dad. He had went and did everything like he spoke. He truly repented. He was making changes in his life and trying to make changes the other. And here's the thing about it is, is that uh, Hashem forgave him. And then when Manasseh returned back, I imagine there was a lot of people there that hated him because he had killed their moms, their dads, their brothers. You know, he's even, you know, he's even one that tradition that he saw to say unto, I say unto. And so here it is, he's been recon- reconciled back to God through forgiveness. And yet there's people there that's going to be lost because they will not forgive Manasseh. 
but I'm going to take this a step forward. You know, like the uh, the ZZ is when we're supposed to obey, you know, remember God's commandments, is that we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, et cetera, and we're supposed to love others as self. Manasseh come around to really love others as self because he had put it, because from the things I read, he had put himself in positions that people that he had done harm to where he had meet them one-on-one -on -one without any bodyguards where they had the chance to get even with him by taking his life. They wanted to, and, he, and if he did, he felt like he deserved that. But people finally, you know, starting the ones that forgave him did it. And that's the thing it is. If you got somebody today that thinks that, that you feel like that maybe they haven't forgiven you for something, don't be mad at them. Pray for them. Because that's the only way they're going to reconcile back to Hashem is by their forgiveness of you. And so don't be angry. And then if you harbor this way, don't play Hashem. If you feel like somebody, oh, I ain't going to, he, don't, he or she don't deserve that forgiveness, then you're playing Hashem. If somebody clearly comes to you and repents, you, you forgive. Because the way I look at it, and I'm fixing the end right here, the way I look at it is, how can I not forgive somebody for something, you know, for something that I've done myself sometime in that? So. Hashem, are you blessed? Menashe and his precious wife, Batya, and all that they have, their home, Hashem, their, their children and grandchildren, and every, every, even every animal that's in covenant with them, Hashem, and with you. May you bless them, Hashem, with an exceedingly long life. May you bless them with exceptional health. May you bless them, Hashem, with divine favor. May you bless them, Hashem, with surprise, wealth, and increase. Father, may you increase their understanding and their wisdom, Hashem. And may they elevate all the more, even to the seventh heaven, Hashem, to the very throne of your glory. Father, thank you, Hashem, that their light, the lapid that is upon them, Hashem, should burn light, bright, burn brightly rather, and let it be an or chadash, Hashem, a new light upon them, Adonai, that they should lead many to belief in Messiah Yeshua. They should lead many into this walk. Thank you, Hashem, that their life is already an example. Thank you, Adonai, and bless them today, Father, and evermore. We speak life to them, and we thank you for them being a part of this mishpaha. We're better for it. Father, in the name of Yeshua and in his merit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Mazal tov. Amen. 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 Please welcome Zakin Rayford as he makes Aliyah to read the Haftarah today. Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. Hard act to follow. <laughs> the blessing of the Haftarah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God. King of the universe, who has chosen good prophets and was pleased with their words that were uttered with truth. Blessed are you, Adonai, who chooses the, the Torah, Moshe, his servant, Israel, his nation, and the prophets of truth and righteousness. Amen. Be reading from Yeshua 2, 1 through 16. Yeshua, the son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shechem with, their, with these instructions. Go inspect the land of Jericho. They left and came to the house of a prostitute named Rechev, where they spent the night. The king of Jericho was told about it. Tonight, some men from Israel came here to reconnoiter the land. The king of Jericho sent a messenger to, Resut, uh, to Rechab. Bring out the men who came to you and are staying in your house, because they have come to reconnoiter all the land. However, the woman, after taking the two men and hiding them, replied, Yes, men did come to me, but I didn't know where they had come from. The men left around the time that the gates were shut when it was dark. Where they went, I don't know. 
But if you chase after them quickly, you will overtake them. Actually, she had brought them up to the roof and hidden them under some stalks of flax which she had spread out there. The men pursued them all the way to the fords of the Ardon. As soon as the pursuit, the, the, uh, pardon me, the pursuit party had left, the gate was shut. The two men had not yet lain down when she returned to the roof and said to them, I know that Adonai has given you the land. Fear of you has fallen on us. Everyone in the land is terrified at the thought of you, at the thought of you. We've heard about Adonai, how Adonai dried up the water in the Sea of Shore ahead of you when you left Egypt, and what he did for you and what he did for you to the kings, the two kings of the Emore on the other side. on the other side of Yardan, Sikan, and Org, that you completely destroyed them. As soon as we heard it, our hearts failed. Because of you, everyone is in a state of depression. For Adonai, your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. So please swear to me by Adonai that since I have been kind to you, you will also be kind to my father's family. Give me some evidence of your good faith, that you, will, uh, that you will spare the lives of my father, mother, brothers and sisters, and all who are theirs, so that we won't be killed. The men replied to her, our lives are certainly worth yours, provided you don't betray our mission. So when Adonai gives us the land, we will treat you kindly and in good faith. Then she lured them by a rope through the window since her house abutted the city wall. Indeed, it was actually built into it. She told them, head for the hills so that the pursuit party won't get their hands on you and hide yourselves there for three days until the pursuers have returned. After that, you can go your own way. Amen. Blessing after the Haftorah. Blessed are you, Adonai HaGad, King of the universe, rock of all eternities, righteous in all generations, the trustworthy God who says and who does, who speaks and fulfills, all whose words are true and righteous. Trustworthy are you, Adonai, our God, and trustworthy are your words. Not one of your words is turned back to its origin unfulfilled. For you are God, trustworthy and compassionate King. Blessed are you, Adonai, the, tr the God who is trustworthy in all his words. Amen. Baruch Hashem. Please welcome Zeke and Yosef as he reads our bar barsot, our Birt HaDashah portion today. Amen. 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 Shabbat shalom, Mishbucha. Shabbat shalom. What a beautiful heritage Amen. have we. Blessing of the Brit HaDashah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, Shalom. King of the universe, who is good, who does good, and who proclaims the good news of redemption through Messiah Yeshua. Blessed are you, Adonai, Redeemer Shalom. of Israel. Amen. Amen. Today I will be reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Then Yeshua left that place and went into the regions of Yehuda and the territory beyond the Yardin. Again, crowds gathered around him, and again, as usual, he taught them. Some Pharisees came, came up and tried to trap him by asking him, Does the Torah permit a man to divorce his wife? He replied, What did Moshe command you? They said, Moshe allowed a man to hand his wife a get and divorce her. But Yeshua said to them, He wrote this commandment for you because of your hard-heartedness. However, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man should leave his father and mother and be united with his wife, and the two are to become one flesh. Thus, they are no longer two, but one. So then, no one should break apart what God has joined together. When they were indoors once more, the Talmudim asked him about this. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against his wife. And if a wife divorces her husband and marries another man, she too commits adultery. 
People were bringing children to him so that he might touch them, but the Talmudim rebuked those people. However, when Yeshua saw it, he became indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Yes, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. And he took them in his arms, laid his hands on them, and made a bracha over them. Amen. 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 Blessing after the Brit Hadashah. Blessed are you, Adonai, our God, King of the universe, our King, Redeemer, Savior, and Shield, who sent Messiah Yeshua, the King of Israel, to ransom your beloved ones. Blessed are you, Adonai, who renews his covenant in love. Amen. Amen. Would you please rise for the Vezot Torah? This is the Torah that Moshe placed before the children of Israel upon the command of Adonai through Moshe's hand. Amen. Let them praise the name of Adonai, for his name alone will have been exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven, and he will have exalted the pride of his people, causing praise for all his devout ones, for the children of Israel his intimate people. Hallelujah. And when it rested, he would say, Return, Adonai, to the myriad thousands of Israel. Arise, Adonai, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priests be clothed in righteousness, and your devout ones will sing joyously. For the sake of David, your servant, turn not away the face of your anointed. For I have given you a good teaching. Do not forsake my Torah. And the Yetzayim, may Hashem Permit us to eat of the fruit of the tree of life that we might live and become like him. The Yetzayim. Yetzayim l'machazikim ba v'tom chaya meushar derachaya Darchei Noam Vechol Netivotea Shalom Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Benashula Chadesh Chadesh Yomei He who blessed our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless this entire holy congregation, along with all the holy congregations, them, their wives, sons, and daughters, and all that is theirs, and those who dedicate synagogues for prayer, and those who enter into the pray, and those who give lamps for illumination, and wine for Kiddush and Abdallah, bread for gifts, and charity of the poor and all who are involved faithfully in the needs of the community. May the Holy One blessed be he pay their reward and remove from them every affliction, heal their entire body, and forgive their every iniquity, and send blessing and success to all their handiwork, along with all Israel, their brethren. And let us say, Amen. B'Shem Yeshua. You may be seated. Amen. Baruch Hashem. What an anointed day. We had a drosh during the worship. We had a drosh during the liturgy. We had a drosh here. Man. Woo. We might just take a restroom break and come back in here and then go to Oneg later. Baruch Hashem. Well, I'm excited to be with you and have the opportunity to, to uh, just uh, be in your presence. Baruch Hashem. And... Uh, we want to welcome Lewis and his family who have just moved here from Jacksonville, Florida to be part of the Mishpaha. Thank you. Aroma. Bienvenidos. Thank you. His wife is from Chile. Now, 
And if you're from Texas, it's not Chile. It's Chile. <laughs> right? Baruch Hashem. Very excited to have you all with us. A part of the Mishpaha here. Baruch Hashem. Parasha Shalach. You know, there's so much to share about this parasha. Um, and I've just happened to figure out here what nuggets to uh, bring down. Um, but I want to begin by uh, saying something that I find very interesting. This is kind of an aside, if you will. But um, do you recall how in the Basorot, in the, in the, in the Basorot, the Gospels, how at one point the people wanted to stone Yeshua, and the crowd was gathered around him. They were going to stone him, and it was around the cliff. Because back in the, back in the day, and uh, if, you don't, if you want to learn more about this, you can ask um, um, Gloria, because she's an expert on this, but uh, they would push people off a cliff, and they would drop rocks on them. That was stoning them. Yeah, so she's highly studied in that area. So anyway, um, <laughs> and so uh, that's how they would stone people. So they want to push him off the cliff. And so it says that suddenly he passed through the crowd, and they did not see him. And basically, he made himself invisible, as it were, and passed through the crowd. What's interesting in the Midrash Shabbat this week, it is the rabbis are bringing down the, the reality that when it talks about uh, Rahab hiding them, the Hebrew literally says that she hid him. Why does it say that she hid him? Why not does it say she hid them? Because the two spies the Midrash brings down were Caleb and Phineas. And Phineas was a priest. And Phineas told Rahab when she said, the people will see you, so I'm going to hide you. And he said, hide Caleb, for I am a priest. And according to the word of God, the rabbis bring down all the scriptures, that a priest is sometimes referred to as a malach of Hashem, an angel of Hashem. And it also brings down that the scripture also refers sometimes to a prophet such as Moshe as a malach Adonai, an angel of Hashem, an angel of Hashem. And so, uh, allegedly, Phineas said, so as an angel can make himself appear and, and disappear, so I can make myself appear and disappear. So hide Caleb, no need to hide me. When they show up, I'll just make myself invisible. So this, this, the Hebrew literally says, so she hid him. Now, why is this important? Because Mashiach is a prophet, a priest, and a king. A priest after the order of Melchizedek, right? And so is it any wonder then that when the crowd was wanting to throw him off the cliff and stone him, that he made himself invisible and passed through them? See, again, we're tying things back to the Midrash. Remember this whole series this year, and it's probably going to continue next year. But this whole series is, is Midrash, Moshe, and Messiah, right? It's looking at the Midrash Urba, uh, according to the weekly parasha, and finding Mashiach. And it's not hard to do, as we just illustrated. But I want to begin with a, a message or a comment from Rabbi Trugman on this section of Bamid Bar which is Parasha Shalak, talking about, initially talking about the whole story of the spies and the debacle thereof. Rabbi Trugman comments here, and he says, The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachman Mendel Schneerson, taught that the numerical value of the word shaliach, that is a messenger with a specific purpose or mission. A shaliach is a messenger with a specific purpose or mission. This is translated apostle. So the apostles in Hebrew, they call them shliachim, shliachim, okay? So a shliach, which, which, has, uh, which has the new, same root as shelach, shelach, so it's the same root. Shliach, shelach, same root word, is 348. If an additional letter yud equaling 10 is added to the word shliach, it equals 358, the same as the numerical value of Mashiach. The Rebbe explains that the additional Yud is the hidden point of pure potential. That is, the spark of Mashiach within every Jew. In other words, it's the Ruach HaKodesh. The prophet Isaiah summed up the Jewish people's mission with, the, with great brevity. He said in Isaiah 42.6, 
to be a light unto the nations. This holy light is initially hidden within every Jew, but when it is activated, the dormant spark of Mashiach and the Jews' hidden leadership potential are activated. When a critical mass of individual sparks is awakened, the energy of Mashiach will descend into the world. One might think that to accomplish the mission of being a light unto the nations, it would be best for Jews to be scattered to the four corners of the earth in order to spread the light. In truth, this is one of the spiritual and mystical reasons for the exile. For the last 2,500 years, the Jewish people have been brought, have brought rather, the light of Torah to every corner of the globe. And the influence of religion, law, ethics, literature, music, art, philosophy, ethics, medicine, and so forth of each host country and culture has been an has been enormous and change-worthy. Nonetheless, Isaiah's vision is predicated on the light first emanating in a most concentrated manner from Israel and Jerusalem and only thereafter spreading to the entire world. In other words, Yeshua, who is the Yud, uh, okay, the Yud of the name Yah, He's the Yud, and inside every Jew who has true Amuna is the Yud, the spark of Mashiach. It's saying that when Jews go out into the world, they bring the, the spark of Mashiach, a.k.a. the teachings of the Word of God, the Torah, the covenant, to the world. But it begins in a concentrated form in Israel and Jerusalem. So where did Mashiach show up first? He showed up in Israel and Jerusalem first. And then when he made his ascent, he said to us, now go into all the world teaching these mitzvot. He, the spark began, the, the, the concentrated light began. We talked last week about the light of the menorah. If you did not see last week's drosh, you need to, you need to watch it. Okay. If I had to pick five droshes for you to watch, last week would be one of the five. But the, the light begins in Israel, begins in Jerusalem, and he says, now take this divine light, take this holy spark into all the world. It's interesting that in Bamidbar 1417, in the Torah scroll, that's where, let's, let's look at that, uh, the book of uh, Bamidbar, that is Numbers 14 and verse 17. 1417. And it says, and now... May the strength of my Lord be magnified. Say magnified. magnified. May the strength of my Lord be magnified as you have spoken, saying, Hashem, slow to anger, abundant in, abundant in kindness, forgiver of iniquity and willful sin, and who cleanses but does not cleanse completely, recalling the iniquity of parents upon the children to the third and fourth generation. What's he saying here? He's saying, let your greatness be magnified. And what is your greatness? Your gift of mercy. Your, what, what, we, what, he, what, what he's asking to be magnified is your, your spirit of forgiveness. In the Torah scroll, the word there is used in Hebrew, yigdal. And in the Torah scroll, the yud, which is normally a, the smallest letter of the Hebrew language, and the Torah scroll is magnified. It's actually enlarged. Why the yud? Why not the whole word? Because the yud represents Mashiach. And so what he's saying is, let your yud be magnified. Why? To bring forgiveness to the nation who is not wanting to enter your land, but wanting to go back to idolatry. So let your yud be magnified. Why? Because the power of the yud is your mercy and your forgiveness, which is Yeshua Mashiach. The enlarged Yud symbolizes Moshe's beseeching God to go beyond, Rabbi Truman writes, beyond the letter of the law by magnifying whatever small merit the people had in order to offset their, their obvious deficiency. Did you just hear that? By saying enlarge Mashiach, enlarge the Yud, what it's saying is we want you to go beyond the letter of the law so that whatever deficiency we have in merit would be magnified, not by us, but by the Yud. Amen. It's interesting to note, therefore, that Mashiach equals, if the Yud means going beyond the letter of the law, then Mashiach equals going beyond the letter of the law. It didn't, listen, before, before your old bad theology tapes get rolling again, 
I didn't say it cancels out, nullifies, erase, gahas shalom, the law. It goes beyond the letter of the law. This is why Mashiach says, listen, you've heard, don't, don't hate, but I'm telling you, don't hate your brother, but I'm telling you, go beyond that and don't hate your enemy. I'm saying here, you've heard it said, don't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, go beyond that to be zanut in what you look at and how you think and take captive those thoughts. Go beyond. See, the whole thing is people think that because the apostles opined about law versus spirit of law versus letter of law, that somehow that's a Christian concept. It's not. It's a Jewish concept. It's written in Jewish literature, the, the balance between spirit and letter. And what it's saying here is the Mashiach causes us to go beyond the letter. And what that means is we keep the letter and then some. Why? Because it's, it's no longer just this, it's no longer this outward source that we're trying to emulate. Now it's a part of who we are. Now we, we live and breathe and move. And this is why we hit Bodhi. You want to see hit Bodhi do, get around somebody who believes in Mashiach. Because our very soul emanates. And this is why that when we're walking about and, and we have those bad thoughts and we just, or whatever, whatever it is, our soul is convicted immediately. We begin to war against those bad thoughts. It's also interesting to note that the word yad, which means hand or arm, a yad in Hebrew is actually from, from your fingers all the way up to your, your shoulder. This is the yad. Yad and yud have the same root. So when the scripture says, open up your hand, what it's literally saying is, open up the aspects of the yud. God works salvation, how? By his mighty hand and outstretched arm. That is his yud, Mashiach. Yes. Yes. See, the right hand of God is Mashiach. Yes. This is why Messiah said, Messiah Yeshua said, I'm going to go and sit at his right hand. Why? Because that's what I am, his right hand. <laughs> I'm the yud. And so when we say, open up your right hand and pour out your blessing, what we're saying is pour out the aspects of yud into my life. I need you to be magnified because I don't have enough. So when we call out, what we're saying is we want you to be magnified and glorified because only in you being magnified and glorified can I elevate. There's not enough gas in the rockets to get me where I need to go. I have a swerve moment here. Midrash Rabbah. Shelach 16.21. Now, now there is a teaching here. And, and it's talking about when the children of Israel are saying that they don't want to go into the land. That they believe that Hashem has, you know, led them astray or what have you and and it says that they began to want to pelt most, they wanted to pelt them with stones. And the Midrash Shabbat says that they wanted to pelt Moshe and Aaron with stones. So here's the community, they're standing there, and they're, they're wanting to, to pelt Moshe and Aaron with stones. And the Midrash brings down that it must have been Aaron and Moshe, and not Caleb and Yehoshua, because it says that, and the, and the glory of Hashem appeared in the tent of meeting to all the children of Israel. And in other words, what they're saying is that the glory of Hashem appeared, the cloud of glory appeared, and it protected it, it obscured it. Was like a, it was like a smoke grenade in a war movie. It, it, it concealed, and the only ones who would have walked into the cloud of glory in the base of Middash, the only ones who could have and would have would have been Moshe and Aaron. Caleb and, and Yehoshua are not priests. They're not Levites. They would have never walked into the cloud of glory like that. So Moshe and Aaron walked into the cloud of glory to be now protected from the masses that wanted to kill them. Remember, Moshe and Aaron are the Mashiachim, so to speak. They're the leaders of the, of the nation. And now the community says, we want new leaders to take us back to slavery. So the, when we're going to get new leaders, we've got to kill the old leaders. So the old leaders walk into the cloud of glory. You follow me? Now, how many of you know that Yeshua came, who's an image of the, of, the, of the Most High God, and he accepted upon himself the punishment, the chastisement that brought us shalom? The enemy was 
pelting him, so to speak, when he, they should have been pelting us. By the way, the, uh, lately uh, I ran into somebody who has been um, uh, having a di- I have been having a dialogue with someone who was who was uh, what's the word I'm looking for? They were tainted. They were their mind was corrupted by the argument of the anti missionaries. And one of the arguments of the anti missionaries is they bring out a verse out of Ezekiel that says a man shall die for his own sins. And I take that out of context, actually. If you go back and study from Jewish literature what that means, it doesn't mean what the anti missionaries think it means. But I digress. But somebody else, and I forget who it was, so forgive me if it was you. Tell me later. I'll give you credit. But somebody shared with me <laughs> how Mashiach contains, according to Jewish thought, Mashiach contains within himself the soul of every human being. Because that is why he is able to lead us to Teshuvah because we have our aspect of our souls within him. So therefore, when he leads us to Yeshua, I mean, to Teshuvah, our, our, we're connected, Right? That's why when he dies, it's as if we died. Because he, our soul is connected with him in every soul. Is, that's why one can die for many because the aspect of every soul is in the one who died for all the many. So when you say, well, you, well a man will die for his own sins, I say, I did through him. Because every soul is in him. And so when, when he died, I died because my soul is in him. And so is your soul in him. So yes, in fact, I did die for my sins. Only through him. See what just happened? Oh, I told you, black keeper in jujitsu. So it says here in the Midrash, and the glory of Hashem appeared in the tent of meeting and all the children of Israel. The Midrash expounds another detail of what ensued during that incident. So now we have, I want you to get the picture, it's important. Moshe and Aaron running into the cloud, and there is Hashem, and the people want to stone Moshe and Aaron, and there is Hashem himself right there, and it says here in the Midrash, this teaches us that the people of Israel were actually throwing stones, and the cloud was receiving them. They were stoning the cloud. The Midrash Rabbah brings down that they were so incensed in this anti-Hashem moment, this anti-Mashiach moment, that when the cloud of glory came and Moshe and Aaron ran into the cloud, they just continued to throw stones. Where? At the cloud. And who was receiving the stones that were meant for Moshe and Aaron? Hashem. See, many court cases, I've said this a thousand times, but, you know, whatever, I'm going to repeat myself. A lot of court cases are won because they establish on precedent. In the Midrash Rabbah, in this story, we see that Hashem had received himself the stones meant for Moshe and Aaron. Therefore, a precedent is set that God can receive the punishment, the evil, the wickedness, the pelting that was meant for us. He receives it himself. Bamidbar 1612. Bamidbar 1612. Excuse me. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that. I meant Midrash Shabbat. Bamidbar. I'm so sorry. So Midrash Shabbat. Bamidbar 1612. Talking about this issue of the spies sent out. It says, the Holy One, blessed be he, said to the people of Israel, in this world, because the spies you sent were emissaries of flesh and blood, they sabotaged their mission. And as a result of that, of that, which was decreed upon that generation, that they would not enter the land. So in other words, what he's saying here is, the problem is you sent out emissaries, you sent out missionaries, you sent out Shilichim of flesh and blood. And as a result of the flesh and blood, I don't know what he's saying. So some people say, and I disagree with them. And if you disagree with me, that's okay. It's America. Thank God for the 4th of July, right? I mean that. No, let me just take an, let me take an aside here. I'll come back to this in a second, but it is J- July 4th weekend. And I want everybody at Sar Shalom to be proud to be Americans. This is not Babylon, okay? Does America, is America culturally uh, not as good as it was when, when Leave it to Beaver was on TV? You better believe it. 
We've got a lot of work to do. But listen, in darkness, the light shines greatness. Don't fall into this trap that these people out there, these naysayers, especially on social media, it's terrible, where they say America is just a Babylon, is corrupt or whatever. Listen, I, I, I agree. I'm, I'm conservative. I vote conservative, and I, I will vote conservative this, this year. But uh, just, just be proud to be Americans because aside from Israel doesn't, aside from Israel, that's like an exception. America is the greatest, greatest uh, country on the planet. Amen. And if you don't think so, it's probably because you've never been anywhere else. It's a great country. So be proud to be Americans. And so this, you know, I encourage you to read the Declaration of Independence. That's what July 4th is all about, right? Read the Constitution. July 4th, by the way, the, the war was not won yet. It was not won until 1781. The war, the declaration was written in 1776. So, you know, there's a lot. Anyway, don't mess with America. America. Anyway, I digress. Be proud to be American. So, it's like he's sitting here. People have said to me that um, Mashiach is just, he's not going to be divine. He's just going to be flesh and blood. He's just going to be a regular man. Now, that is a anti-missionary argument that can be easily destroyed in about five minutes. And I destroyed it last week in 45 minutes. And I'm going to destroy it even more here in just a second. It's a, it's a, it's a foolish argument. And, and destroy it. And I don't, even have to use, I don't even have to use one verse from the Brit of Shah. Not even one. I just use Jewish literature. And here's an example. Hashem is saying, because the emissaries who went out and spied out the land, they were flesh and blood, and as a result, they brought wrath upon the nation. So, he says, however, in the world to come, I will send you my celestial messenger suddenly, and he will clear the path before me. What? <laughs> celestial means divine, not of this world. All right? And he will clear the path before me. Now, looking also the Midrash Rabbah, 1626, moving quickly here. We have to ask the question, why Mashiach? By the way, throughout the Midrash Rabbah, and I, I didn't, there are so many references, I didn't make note of a specific reference because it's all throughout this particular portion. We have the situation where Hashem is mad at the people because he says to them, you, you won't believe me, you won't follow me, you won't have a Muna in me, even though I'm showing you all of these signs. Now, Mashiach Yeshua came and he did miracle after miracle after miracle. The difference is the Torah does say that if someone shows up and they're doing all these miracles or even raising people from the dead, but they're leading you away from Torah, this is Devarim 13, if they're doing all these miracles, they're prophesying, all these great prophecies, you know, whatever. People will say, I have a prophecy, I have a word from God for you. People say it to me. Sometimes we've had on occasion, people show up to Sar Shalom, they, they're first time guests usually, and uh, this has happened on rare occasion, but I just, this, is, this is something, this is, this is a moment for you to learn. And they never do this around any of the leadership, but they'll find you in the parking lot or they'll find you in the hover hall or they'll find you in the hallway and they'll say, I've got a word from God from you. I, they're like a prophecy, right? It's like, a, we call that parking lot prophecies, all right? So, you know, be very nice to them and say to them, say, um, man, that's, that's awesome. But before you share your prophecy with me, can you explain to me your observance level? What do you think about the Shabbat? Should we be keeping the Shabbat? What about kosher eating? Do you think we should be eating kosher? What about the, the, the Yom Tovim? What about the holidays of Hashem? What do you think about that? And if their response is anywhere close to the negative, like that's not for today or that doesn't matter or we live by a new covenant or something like that, just say, you know what? Just hold your thought. I'll daven about it. I don't really want to hear it. I don't know how you say that nicely, but... <laughs> The reason is because the scripture, the word of God says that if somebody prophesies and does great miracles, even raises the dead, but they are not leading you in the path of Torah, then they are a test from Hashem and a false prophet. God himself said that. God said that. 
And so we know Mashiach wasn't a false prophet because he's leading us into Torah observance. He said in Matthew 5, 17, he said, don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. And I'm telling you today, he says, not even a jot or a tittle from the Torah will pass away until everything is fulfilled. He says, I'm not even, I'm not telling you, the Yud won't pass away. Whoa, see what happened there? Even the Yud. He said, look, don't think that. So we know. So he's doing all these miracles and Hashem is getting mad at the, at the people because he said, I'm doing miracle after miracle for you and you're not following me. Why is this relevant? Because if you listen to some people, anti-missionaries anyway, they'll say, well, God, you know, we don't, we don't, God's not, you know, we don't have to have our amuna based on miracles. That's not entirely true. It is true if you're believing in a miracle, but there is no path of Torah. But if the path of Torah is there, then the miracle is a sign for you. So miracles are relevant. And it's replete throughout the end, this entire portion here, that this is what God is trying to say to us. So there's a, a comment here. It says here, a question of halakha was discussed. What is the law with respect to carrying a child who has a stone in his hand on the Sabbath? Our rabbis taught in the Mishnah, a person may carry his son on the Sabbath even while there is a stone in the child's hand or even a basket and while there is a stone inside the basket. That's in Shabbos 21.1. It says here, you may learn from this that which occurred with the generation of the wilderness. For the Holy One, blessed be he, carried them in the wilderness, as it were, as a man carries his son, Devarim 131. And he did this even while there was an idol in their possession. And as it is stated, even when they made themselves a molten calf, you and your great compassion did not forsake them in the wilderness. Nehemiah 9, 17 through 18. Wow. Now, here is this, people say, why, why do we need Mashiach? If you've got Torah and you've got good deeds, you can, you can, uh, you can I mean, the scripture kind of indi indicates, if not plainly states, that if we follow the Torah, we can elevate and we, become, we can make teshuva. So the question becomes, why do, then we, do we need Mashiach? And it's true that we do the mitzvot, we can elevate, but we can only go so far because as I said last week, no matter how perfect your mitzvah keeping you're going to die. There's no amount of mitzvah keeping. There's no perfection of walking Torah that will cause you to live forever. This is why the sages say that even the most righteous among us, no matter how perfect they were, they all died because of the sin of Adam. And so what we have with the, with the golden calf, and this is important for you to understand, the nation of Israel, our nation, after the sin of the golden calf, was always and forever tainted with idolatry. Always and forever tainted with idolatry. This is why the rabbi say Moshe went up and got a second set of tablets, remember? Brought them down, but it wasn't as perfect as the first set. And so the rabbis write and say that nothing will be brought back, that the, the covenant will not be repaired and restored to its original perfection until Mashiach comes. Until that time, everybody is tainted with idolatry, ultimately. Now you're saying, Rabbi, man, you're way off base with this. That's not true. Are you trying to say that all of Israel is a nation of idolaters? I'm not saying that they're bad people. I'm not saying that people who follow the Torah are bad people. I'm not saying we're bad people. I'm simply saying that we require Mashiach to eradicate, erase, wash away the sin of the golden calf. How do we know this to be true? Through Jewish literature. Through the Midrash Shabbat. This is why we need Mashiach. It says here, the gifts that were forfeited. 16.24. So at Mount Sinai, when the Torah came down, there were gifts that Hashem brought to his people. Okay, let me see here. Let me turn back to 24. There's a lot of, lot of literature here. Okay, here it is. The verse states, Hashem said to Moshe, how long will these people anger me? This is to be understood in light of that which is written, Vatifreu, my every counsel and you desired, not my reproof. They spurned, not all my reproof. 
What is the meaning of the word vatifreu? Rather, God was telling the people of Israel, any good I intended to do for you, you spoiled it and nullified it. As it is stated, vatifreu, my every counsel. God says, originally I said regarding the people of Israel, I shall descend to rescue it from the hand of Egypt. However, you did not act accordingly. Rather, you came to the sea and immediately you spoiled my counsel, as it is stated, and they rebelled at the sea, the Sea of Reeds. Later on, he says, I descended on Mount Sinai for your sake, accompanied by thousands upon thousands and myriads upon myriads of angels at the time of the giving of the Torah. And at that time, I assigned each and every one of you two angels, one of whom girded each person with a weapon. Now, it says here in the notes, these are spiritual weapons that would defeat spiritual enemies. And it goes on to say, these are not, these are not natural weapons. It goes on to say, and one of whom placed a crown on his head. Yeah. And it goes on to say, and Rabbi Yehuda of Zipporin says, he girded them with a belt. The belt of truth. Which it says in the comments, the belt brings strength. Why? Because truth brings strength. Rabbi Samiai says, he dressed them in royal garments upon which was written the infallible name of Hashem. It was engraved. And it says in the book of Revelation that he showed up on a white horse and he had upon his garment the name of Hashem. Talking about Mashiach. And we clothe ourselves in Mashiach. And when we clothe ourselves in Mashiach, then we clothe ourselves in that garment that has the yod heh vav on it. It says here, and all the days that this divine gift, divine? Oh, I'm sorry. Let me read that again. I must have misunderstood. My <laughs> English is not my first language. <laughs> and all the days that this divine gift was in their possession, nothing evil could befall them, nor could the angel of death do anything harmful to them or dominate them. In other words, at the giving of the Torah before the golden calf, all evil was eradicated from the nation to include death. Death was swallowed up in victory. And it says, however, once they sinned by worshiping the golden calf, listen to this, once they sinned by worshiping the golden calf, Moshe said, in the name of God, and now remove your ornaments from yourself, and I shall know what I shall do to you, Exodus 33, 5. At the same time, Scripture states that people heard this bad tidings and they became grief-stricken, and no one donned his ornaments. What is written afterward? So the children of Israel were stripped of their ornaments from Mount Horeb. What ornaments? The ornaments that God had given them, the belt, the crown, the weapons, the clothing, the, the victory. They were stripped of all of that. Why? At the sin of the golden calf. And do people die today? What happened to a man shall die for his own sins? We're all dying today because our forefathers danced around the golden calf. But guess what? We were stripped then, but we're clothed now. The angel of death appeared before God and said, did you make me for nothing? I can't touch the children of Israel. So what it says right here. He says, the entire universe is under your dominion, except for this nation, which I've chosen for myself. He, the Holy One, blessed be, he went on to tell the angel of death, I created you so that you should bereave among the idolaters to the exclusion of this nation Israel over which you have no dominion. That was until they became idolaters. Uh, 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 deductive reasoning. The angel of death has dominion over idolaters. Therefore, the only one who the, whom the angel of death cannot have dominion over is those who are not idolaters. So this is why Mashiach came, is to remove the stench of idolatry from our lives. We were able to attain that which was unattainable without him. We had a restored covenant, but he renewed the covenant completely. That's why we need Mashiach. In, in the Midrash Shabbat, and 
section 16 in paragraph 23, it says something remarkable. It says, thus anyone who was at least 20 years of age was not allowed to enter the land. Okay? Whether he was together with the spies in their council or not. Wait a minute. A man shall die for his own sins. Yet, if you were 20 years and up, and let's say you were 20 years, let's say you were 25, and you're standing there and you're saying, no, 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 let's go take the land. This is ridiculous. Y'all, y'all are idiots. Y'all are idiots. I'm going with God. I'm going with Moshe. Let's go take it. And God's judgment, however, was you had to die too. What happened to a man should die for his own sins? That's not fair. But judgment becomes upon the nation. Also in the Midrash Shabbat, in an earlier paragraph, in paragraph 21, it says, this refers to the punishment that you bequeath as a heritage for future generations. Talking about death. You see that this, it's not just the sin of Adam. It's not just the sin of Adam, but it's the sin of the golden calf. Because God is saying, because the children of Israel dance around the golden calf, I bequeath as a heritage for future generations the punishment of death. He bequeathed us. That's not something you want to be bequeathed with. <laughs> One more section and before we conclude today. It says right here, I just turned to something, by the way. It says, and how long will you not have faith in me despite all the signs that I performed in your midst? Yeshua said when he went to the temple to celebrate Hanukkah, 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 he says there, he says there that uh, if you're not gonna believe what I'm telling you, at least believe the miracles I'm doing. Now, it says here, God said the common practice in, in this world is that a person acquires a servant with the intention that if he should embark on a journey, his servant will precede him on the road and prefer, prepare for him a suitable resting place. However, I did not do that. Now, before I read this, to, to get the true impact, I wanted to take you back to what I taught last week in, in, an, in another drosh, that there were two arcs, Right? The, the ark that contained the renewed tablets and the manna and the rod and so on, that was in the uh, uh, Mishkan. And when the children of Israel set out, Judah went first and the ark was in the middle of the nation and so on. But the other ark went out a three-day, three days, three-day journey, three, three-day journey before the nation. And it had within it only one thing. That is the broken original tablets that were broken for our sins. And it was that ark that it says in the Midrash Shabbat this week that two streams of fire shot out from it. Two streams, two messiahs, two streams of fire shot out and destroyed all the serpents and scorpions and destroyed all the enemy, basically cleared a plan. It was the Marines. Oh, I had to throw that in there, but it's true. But listen, because so get, that, get that image in your head. The tablet with the broken, the, the ark with the broken tablet. Get that in your head, right? We know that's Messiah Yeshua. Hello? Okay, listen. However, he says, I don't do that. I don't do what? I don't send a servant out. He said, rather, although you are my servants, it is nonetheless I who, who would prepare for you a suitable resting place, as it is said, and the ark of the covenant of Hashem journey before them a three-day distance to search out for them a resting place. What? God said, I went before you. He was the ark with the broken tablets that went out there and got all the scorpions and snakes out of the way. I went before you. This is why the scripture says, when the ark would travel, Moshe would say, arise Adonai. This is why Moshe said that he knew what was going down. And so what happened is the ark showed up in the first century, an ark that would become the broken tablets and made his tabernacle with us. And he says, I've come to drive all the snakes and serpents away. I've come to defeat your enemies for you. 
and I'm gonna go prepare a place. Thank you, Rebetzin. I'm gonna go and prepare a place for you, a three-day journey to prepare a place for you. How we do? Oh. The Holy One, blessed be he said, I shall destroy the people of Israel from before me. Moshe said before him, Master of the world, you are slow to anger. Now if a servant's deeds are good and he obeys his master and his master will look upon him with a pleasant countenance, people will not accredit his master for his servant deeds warrant such a response. So how is God going to get the glory? How's God going to get the glory? Because if the servant is obedient and all of his deeds are great, they're not going to look to the master because the servant, you know, he gets paid what he's due. He's earned the wage. How does God get the glory? And when do they accredit the master? When the servant is of bad nature and notwithstanding that, his master looks upon him with pleasant countenance. Similarly, you are slow to anger. Please do not look at the stiff neckness of the people of Israel as it is stated do not turn to the stubbornness of this people. Deuteronomy 9, 27. And Hashem said, on account of you, I will forgive them. God gets the glory when he looks at us and he says, you don't deserve my love. You don't deserve my forgiveness. There's nothing about you that deserves any accreditation, but I am going to look upon you with favor. And as a result of that, I'm going to get the glory. It's all about his namesake. And I, want, I just want to conclude that thought in this drosh with just reading a little bit, a section of the letter to the Romans that the Shaliach, Shaul, wrote. He was opining about, he was giving a drosh, he was opining about Avraham. He says, what then shall, this is chapter four of, of the letter to the Romans. What then shall we say that Abraham, our father, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had nothing to boast about. Didn't we just read that? The Midrash Shabbat. It isn't interesting. The Shliach Shaul, who was a studied rabbi at the time, happens to know this thought. Yeah, he had he's nothing to boast about, but not before. He, he has something to boast about, that is his good deeds, but not before God. What does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now, when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but as an obligation. We just read this. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts God, who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of a man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin, Hashem, will never count against him. In this blessedness, is, is this blessedness, blessedness only for the circumcised, that is, the Jewish born Jew, or also for the uncircumcised, that is, the one who's born not Jewish? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteous under that circumstance. Under what circumstance, rather, was it credited? Was it after or before he was circumcised? It was not after, but before. And he received, now listen, this is important. He was accredited with righteousness before he was circumcised, right? And people stop there and say, see, that's all you need. No, it's not. Listen to what the Shaliach is saying. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteous that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. In other words, he moved forward with the natural when the spiritual was met. The natural was a sign of the spiritual, but he didn't say, oh, I don't need the natural, I've got the spiritual. No, he went ahead and moved forward with it as God commanded some people misrepresent Paul they, in another section, I think it's 1 Corinthians 7. They say that, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. All that matters is obeying the commandment. <laughs> people that read that don't understand what he's talking about clearly because being circumcised is the commandment. So people say, you don't have to be circumcised. Why not? Because the apostle Paul wrote and said, that it doesn't matter if you're circumcised or uncircumcised. What it matters is obeying the commandment. And being circumcised is the commandment. What? It's all right. So it says here, he received a sign of circumcision. So then he is the father of all who believe, but have not been circumcised in order that the righteous might be credited to them. 
And he is also the father of the circumcised who are not only only are circumcised, but also walk in the footsteps of the faith of our father, Abraham before, Abraham, the faith of our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. What it's saying there is, listen, that God is getting the glory not because our righteousness is so wonderful. He gets the glory because he looks upon us who are undeserving of anything and says, you're my child. And I carried you even though you had a stone in your hand. Even though you had an idol in your hand. A stone is equal to an idol in Jewish thought. You had a stone in your hand and yet in the wilderness I carried you until such a time as you dropped the stone and allowed me to be your father in heaven. Father, we thank you for your tender mercy. We thank you because you took the pelting of the stones that we deserved. We thank you, Hashem, for all the miracles you do for us in this wilderness. We thank you that through Mashiach Yeshua, you have rolled away the shame of Egypt, the shame of the golden calf. We thank you, Hashem, that we will experience the resurrection of the dead because of your great grace and tender mercy. Father, thank you for all of your kindness. Thank you, Hashem, for this country that we live in. Thank you, Hashem, for the freedom that we have. We pray that you can continue the freedom. Father, on this July 4th weekend, we would be remiss if we weren't to pray for the restoration of righteous judges upon this land. Father, we know that you choose every leader and you give every country the leader they deserve. So, Father, we pray, Hashem, that we would be found worthy to have a better leader. Hashem, restore to us righteous judges. Choose for us the person that you would have. And Father, we pray that it would be a blessing. For even as Jeremiah spoke to the people, the prophetic word of Hashem, that we should live in the cities where we are in the diaspora and that we should prosper. And that we should pray for the prosperity of our cities and our regions and our countries that we live in because as the country prospers, so do we prosper. So Father, you won't find us bad-mouthing this country. You won't find us praying for its destruction or longing for Armageddon or praying to God in heaven that you would rain down fire upon Washington, D.C. No, Lord. We pray for the survival of this nation. We pray for the blessing of America. We indeed say, God, bless America. We indeed say, Father, bless this nation and save it and help us to be a light. If there's darkness around us, and there is, help us to be a light. Hashem, bless us all. And may your name be praised through us. In the merit of Yeshua Mashiach, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please welcome.